Well, hello there. Welcome to the Pacific War Channel, where we cover the entire Asia-Pacific War of 1937 to 1945 and all the major events that led up to it. And oh my god, we're actually covering something during 1937 to 1945. Round of applause for everybody who's been reminding me to finally get out of 19th century China and Japan. Before you click away from this video, mind you, this is going to be a podcast format, but also more of like a documentary. There's going to be war footage, we're going to have maps put up, and we're going to go through the entire battle of Hong Kong, because this episode is the Battle of Hong Kong. Here with my friend Eric. Hello. You might have recognized him from the uh, last time we did Battle of Midway, interesting facts. And this is going to be quite an interesting one because it's, uh, it's pretty close to home for us. This involves, of course, one of, I guess, arguably the largest effort by Canada in the Pacific War. And uh, quite a tragedy, to say the least. Horrifying way. Uh, yeah. yeah. And uh, without further ado, I must remind the audience that uh, this is uh, a warning. Uh, we're going to be talking about things that involve many atrocities. Uh, might be some graphic images, I'm not sure what I can get away with on YouTube, <laughs> mind you. And uh, needless to say, we're going to be talking about some gruesome things. So you have been warned. Kids, stay away. For our audio listeners, thank you for listening to this podcast. And I assure you, you still will get good quality out of this, even though you're not going to see these magnificent battle maps and war footage I will be editing in later. Or my parrot, who has joined us as well. <laughs> okay, so we're going to start off by just giving a little bit of um, a history of Hong Kong. So for those of you who actually watch my channel, and I thank you for doing so, Hong Kong was part of the Qing Dynasty, and in 1842, with the Treaty of Nanjing, it was given over to Britain. Uh, this was during the First Opium War. Now, we're going to fast forward a little bit to the 1860s. A second Opium War hits, and Britain ends up writing the Convention of Beijing, which gives secession for Kulon over to Britain. So this is actually expanding upon the already having like Hong Kong Island, and now it is uh, taking Kulon. In 1898, on July the 1st, the second convention of Beijing leases the new territories. So the new territories includes basically what we see as Hong Kong today, excluding Kulung and Hong Kong Island. So it's all the territories just north of it. Probably put it up on a map for those watching. It's leased for 99 years, which would end in 1997, as I think we all are quite familiar with now. Uh, during 1941 to 1945, Hong Kong is occupied by the Empire of Japan, which we're going to explain soon. And the governor of Hong Kong, Mark Atchison Young, surrendered it to Isogai Renizuke, who became the first Japanese governor of Hong Kong. And uh, it was quite a terrible situation. During the occupation, hyperinflation led to food rationing, and a lot of people ended up starving to death. Um, the Hong Kong dollar was outlawed and replaced with Japanese military yen, which you can imagine was done under some rather terrible reasons. They're basically just embezzling, taking the Hong Kong dollar out, selling it, and then using it for the war effort. And anyways, that's why more people ended up starving. Uh, also, the Japanese deported everybody that was sick or, you know, dying of starvation over to the mainland of China, and the population, which was once 1.6 million, uh, shrunk to 600,000 by 1945. So a lot of people went missing. Not to mention there was a mass amount of executions as well. Uh, after World War II had concluded, Hong Kong, you know, went right back to that lease, so Britain ended up owning it, all the way up to 1997, as we all know. And then in 1997, Hong Kong was returned to China, and it was under the one country, two systems policy. Boy, boy, is this, uh, this is a touchy subject to get into, but Hong Kong had some autonomy and people's rights, uh, which are not the same under the PRC, we'll say. Today, Hong Kong has a separate legal system from the mainland of China, and the rights, you know, include freedom of assembly, the freedom of speech, and these freedoms, you know, they're the basic law. And they will expire, actually, in uh, 2047, apparently. Now, I'll just say a little piece on it. The ongoing Hong Kong protests began over an extradition bill, 
extradition bill that was put forward in 2019, which could have allowed the extradition of people from Hong Kong to mainland China. This, however, it goes into a sloth of other political issues that are going around and is still ongoing and it's a very sensitive topic. But that is all we will say about the history of Hong Kong. <laughs> <laughs> now before my friend is going to get into a summary, well actually, it's not even a summary, it's going to be the complete battle of Hong Kong. I just wanted to kind of explain why, why did Japan attack Hong Kong? So, as you should know, Japan had been at war with China since 1937 and chose to avoid conflict with Great Britain and other Western nations, which was smart. Britain began the fight for its survival in 1940 against Germany uh, during the Battle of Britain, and it was literally fighting for its survival. And Japan was not stupid. They knew that Britain was fighting for its survival, and they knew that Britain couldn't afford to put troops in the east. So, inevitably, when Japan was attacking all these areas of China, it basically surrounded Hong Kong especially when they took Guangzhou, which is uh, Canton today. So with Hong Kong completely surrounded and Japan in a peculiar situation with the oil being taken, you know, from it at this point, because the United States was, you know, placing embargoes. Oh, excuse me. The United States was placing embargoes on Japan and squeezing them for, you know, all the money that was worth. Japan decided that they were going to simultaneously attack a bunch of Western nations in order to gain the resources they needed to continue their war in China. This inevitably led to Pearl Harbor, Dutch East Indies was the primary target, uh, Singapore, and Hong Kong, which was already surrounded. Again, um, there was like, I would say there's three major reasons for, you know, invading Hong Kong to increase the greater East Asian co-prosperity co sphere which uh, was a pseudo way of kind of consolidating their control over Asia with Japan on top to most importantly stop shipments going into Hong Kong to Chiang Kai-shek's forces because Hong Kong was an important port of trade almost 40 percent of everything was coming into Hong Kong so they honestly they had to stop that to be able to fight China and they knew inevitably that they were going to be at war with the West anyways and it was a great time to finally unleash the Kraken so to say all right, my friend Eric is now going to walk us through the Battle of Hong Kong. All right, so first let's look at a map because it's there's no shame in not knowing exactly where Hong Kong is. China's a pretty big place. So if you look at the map right here, it might be a little hard to see, but you can see this little peninsula here. You can't really see Hong Kong Island on here, but just so you know, there's, like Craig was saying before, Hong Kong consists of this mainland uh, peninsula right here and the islands that surround it. I'm totally gonna edit a real map over this so that people probably have a better idea because yeah. this would be impossible for them to see. <laughs> Audio listeners, this would be a nightmare. Yeah. <laughs> but essentially, what you have to understand about Hong Kong is the main city and the actual main harbors are on the mainland of Hong Kong. Hong Kong Island actually is only, um, they have one city uh, big one, Victoria City, which is the main one there. But other than that, there's not much militarily speaking on Hong Kong Island other than the fact that it's an island, thereby it's a little more defensible than say a mainland. Now, as Craig was saying before, this was a very important place, especially because of the trade. It was the only port that China had left open. Yeah, and 40% of all the materials were coming yeah. through it. So this was honestly a knockout blow against yeah. China. The only other way is through the Indian trade, which would go along here all the way up through all the mountain ranges into China. On, the, on pack mules and everything you can imagine. It was a nightmare. Yeah. And yeah, it became a problem. It was a problem throughout the entire war. Open, the whole Burma campaign yeah. was because of this. Exactly. It was the, the Burma Road, as yeah. it was once called. So keeping this would be beneficial for the Allies. But Churchill, he knew what was happening. He knew and England considered Hong Kong as just an outpost of Britain. It wasn't like it was an actual colony that they were going to fight to defend. Churchill knew that England at the state could not defend Hong Kong. 
but he did believe they could do a protracted defense over several months to help tie down the Japanese as England kind of situated itself in the Southeast Asia and then would decide on what type of action to make. Mostly to kind of give Singapore a breath. Yeah. So, just to give a little background more onto that day, um, they attacked Hong Kong. Well, they bombed Hong Kong the same day as Pearl Harbor. It was... Just to explain one thing, because this is confusing yeah. for people, the time difference is what gets people. Yeah. It technically was four hours after Pearl Harbor. Yes, it tech in our minds, if we were you know in Hawaiian time, it was the next day, but because of the time zone, it technically was just four hours after the attack. I know yeah. a lot of people... Like, yeah, so it was... It was attacked on the same day of Pearl Harbor, and the Japanese had the same mentality, grab as much land in the first stages of this war and hold it. Hong Kong was one of those because they believed they could cut off the supply to China, making it easier for them to then invade. So for Japan, Hong Kong was important. For England and, and its um, allies, it was more of a, let's try and hold down the Japanese for a little bit, but let's be honest, there's no real way we can defend it. Churchill had no illusions yeah. when he sent uh, the Canadians later to reinforce it. It was yeah. just ceremonial. They knew that they were never going to yeah. hold it. And in fact, like, during 1940, when the Battle of Britain was going on, England actually took out a large portion of the troops there because they needed them, literally, because it was fighting for its life, and they didn't see Hong Kong as an actual something they needed to defend. The only reason the Canadian soldiers were sent was because Churchill believed if he put more forces there, it would act as a deterrent to Japan into invading. But at the same time, they never expected Japan would attack first. No one expected uh, Pearl Harbor. There were hints about it, as we were talking before in a, a previous podcast. People, there was, there was some intelligence data going around, but it was kind of hard to pinpoint exactly what was going to happen. So, and that's over the US, that's France, that's England, all of them, their intelligence data in the beginning of the war was very spotty at best. It was only later in the war that you really saw that intelligence come out and then they were able to read all the messages and predict maneuvers. But at this point, Japan actually had the superiority in intelligence, especially over England, because England didn't think Japan was gonna attack. They thought they had enough forces there to push off. And I think that's actually a good segue now we can talk about, before we get into the actual battle, just break down exactly what forces were at Hong Kong on both sides. Now, and this is, we're just getting straight into it, it's 1941. Mm -hmm. Hong Kong is effectively surrounded at this point. Mm -hmm. There's a naval blockade that's going to be enacted. Exactly. Now, actually, that's a good place. So let's start off with the naval forces there because England did send some naval forces and the majority of it was three destroyers that they sent to Hong Kong. But Outdated destroyers, mind you, mostly. Yes. Two of them were World War One style destroyers that were, let's just say, less than useless in World War II. Um, they also had a bunch of um, gunboats and uh, torpedo boats too, but they were also very small in nature and... There weren't much use for them during this war. I mean, and, not against the Japanese Navy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, yeah. there were times when the gunboats kind of provided artillery support off the shore in the beginning days of the battle. But other than that, the Navy really was neglected. In fact, the first day of the war, two of the destroyers actually ran the blockade under orders. And, and they got, got out. out. Yeah, surprisingly, yeah, and, it's impressive that they were able to get out of the blockade in time. There was also, at this point, a small air force on the island, too. A small, like, literally very small. It had five planes. And three of those planes were old Vickers torpedo reconnaissance bombers that were useless beyond yeah, me. pretty much. And to add insult to injury, on December 8th, the first bombardment was targeted at the airfield, and three of the five planes were shot out, like, never even got in off the, the ground. The other two, there were reports of sorties. They did engage in some small sorties, but nothing of notable interaction. Fun fact, uh, during the bombardment of the airport, Sun Yat-sen's uh, widow was evacuated successfully. So she ended up getting out of there because she was uh, there at the time. Well, that, and that brings up a, another good point. Just, just prior to this battle, the only evacuees 
well, the majority of the evacuees was Western women and children out of Hong Kong. The actual Hong Kong population was not evacuated. The civilians were, were left there, more or less, during the battle. Now, uh, on the British side, there were... The soldiers consisted of British and Commonwealth soldiers. Most notably, you had Scots, the, 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 the Royal Scots. You also had... Um, Punjab and um, Rajput warriors were also there from India, and also, most notably, Canadians for us were there. It does hit close to home. This is one of the very few battles yes. Canada gets to talk about in the Pacific War, mm -hmm. and uh, it's going to be a gruesome one for us, to say the least. It, it, it will be. So as for the Japanese, they outnumbered the Allied forces four to one, they had about 50,000, I believe, against roughly 14,000 allies. And uh, just to give an idea of who was running the show, Lieutenant General in charge of this, Takashi Sake, uh, he had a colorful past, to say the least. He was actually stationed in Jinan, Shandong Province in China, which uh, is infamous, actually, during <laughs> just before the war kicked off. There was a huge incident called the Jinan Incident which was a dispute between the NRA and the Japanese soldiers. Um, they actually did clash. And uh, he himself, or part of his regiment, may have been responsible for the murder of the Queen Myung army's emissaries who were doing negotiations on May the 4th. Now, he quickly made his way up the ranks. This, uh, the Jinan incident happened in 1928, excuse me. He, he made his way up through the ranks and he made Lieutenant General in 1939. So, the Battle of Hong Kong, he was given command, and uh, to say the least, the Battle of Hong Kong is renowned for atrocities. A lot of massacres, uh, rapes, murders, and a lot of killing of POWs and people after they've surrendered. This is his legacy, actually, at this point. He was um, actually the Put is a governor of Hong Kong after they had successfully invaded it, but he was quickly taken back home to Japan. And for, uh, I actually don't know the reason off the top of my head, but in 1945 he was asked to be re enlisted because he had retired in the meantime while he was at Japan. And just before he could get back into the action, uh, the atomic bombs had gone off and Japan had surrendered. But. He was, um, <laughs> he was put on the war crimes trials in Nanjing, and on August the 27th, 1946, uh, he was convicted of the atrocities that occurred during the entire Battle of Hong Kong, and he was executed on September the 30th by firing squad. His second in command, General Tadamichi Kurubayashi, was a deputy military attaché to Washington before the Battle of Hong Kong. He spent two years traveling the United States, and he actually studied at Harvard for a little bit of time. And he is on the, the record as being somebody who told his family just before Pearl Harbor repeatedly that the last country Japan should ever fight is America. Because in his views, much like uh, Yamamoto, America was a sleeping giant and shouldn't have been attacked. Uh, he was ordered into the field as a chief of staff of the 23rd Army, commanded by Takashi Sekai. And during the invasion of Hong Kong, he actually... Um, reportedly did some good. Um, it's an unusual fact the Japanese army, but he would go to the hospitals and actually check on the wounded. Apparently this is something that was rarely seen of higher officers. And he ended up after the Battle of Hong Kong being sent to Iwo Jima where he uh, died. So these are the two commanding officers of the Japanese. All right, so uh, I guess now we will actually get into the start of the actual battle. Now that we have all the uh, information about the two armies, why Hong Kong was being targeted, and the setup and everything. First off, we have to bring up the British commander was Major General Christopher Maltbury. Now he was in charge of all the forces in this area, and he decided to make what was called the Karun Defensive Line, or more commonly known as the Gin Drinkers uh, Defensive Line. It's a great name. <laughs> it was. It's named after there was a bay nearby called Gin Drinkers Bay, so that's where it got it from. I thought, <laughs> misleadingly, it was because there was a bunch of English, so, <laughs> you know. Yeah, it makes sense. That's why you need to do your own research and find out and not assume things. So, 
this defensive line consisted of three portions. Um, one in the northern, uh, western, northern, eastern, and then one more a little to the south of mainland Hong Kong. And then the Canadians were situated on Hong Kong Island in the south, just in case the Japanese wanted to make an invasion of inland. But Maltbury did believe they were going to attack from the mainland as it just made more sense because you had the Chi uh, Japanese already stationed there. It just makes sense to invade from there. So on the 8th was the first day of action, which was similarly the same day as Pearl Harbor, but time differences really muddy this whole thing up. But essentially on December 8th, they, the Japanese attacked the airfield uh, in Hong Kong. And they took out three, as I said before, three of the five planes situated there, essentially wiping out the entire Air Force that was there. Which couldn't have done anything, you know, needless yeah. to say, it was not much of an Air Force, but yeah. Yeah. There were small sorties that did occur, but nothing really that would have changed anything in the battle. Now, so what happened was, it took the Japanese two more days to organize themselves for a full attack on Hong Kong in the mainland against the Gin Drinkers Line. Now, the first thing they did was on December 10th, in the evening, the Japanese snuck troops closer and closer to the line overnight. And then by midnight, they attacked what was called uh, Shingmun Ridout, which was manned by 40 Royal Scots. Uh, now, this, was, this Ridout had five pillboxes, and it was the point of one of uh, the Gin Drinker's line's defenses. And it was all overlapping crossfire, and it was flanked on both sides by Allied forces. But they never saw the Japanese come up. And before they even knew what was happening, the Scots, two of the pillboxes, were destroyed in that fight. Now, the Royal Scots did make many counterattacks and uh, push them off while getting pushed back. But eventually, after five hours of fighting, they were eventually, just because they were outnumbered so greatly, were pushed away from the readout, essentially put in a hole in the line. There were small other engagements across the gin drinkers line, but the breakthrough was at this readout. At, at the same time, the Japanese um, south of Hong Kong Island had captured the small island off the coast um, called Lehman Island. And from there, they decided that they were going to try and push into, the main, uh, into Hong Kong Island on the same day. So what they did, they made a bunch of makeshift rafts and a bunch of other military equipment all together. And they decided they were just going to try and push through the strait that was there against the Canadians situated. Well, the Canadians were aware of their presence and because of that had brought their artillery to bear on them for this exact reason. So as the Japanese tried to cross the strait to invade Hong Kong Island, they were shredded by the Canadians and were forced to turn back. Yeah, the Canadians had the high grounds when they were artillery striking them, so it was pretty easy to take yeah. them out. But this had unforeseen consequences and Maltbury didn't... Maltbury reacted to this by thinking Hong Kong Island was actually a main target in the beginning stages of this battle. So because of that, he left all the Canadian regiments on that island there to protect in case of an invasion. And what this meant was he couldn't pull them off that island to bring them to reinforce the gaps that were now forming in the on the 10th of December and following the, the 11th of December. So this essentially caused Maltbury to eventually evacuate the mainland of China merely because he, he couldn't bring in reinforcements. So we're talking about the new territories in the Kulun area. Basically they were using guerrilla warfare tactics for a few days and effectively slowly evacuating all the troops into the Hong Kong island because there was no way to hold it. Okay, so by the end of December 12th, the Japanese had broken through the gin drinkers line at the readout. They had tr attempted to invade Hong Kong Island, but couldn't make any headway. But because of this, Maltbury had to keep troops on the island. So now we get to December 13th, and this was a huge day for the battle, because at this point, Maltbury realized his position 
was untenable on the mainland. And because of this, he was forced to retreat back to Hong Kong Island. And this retreat consisted of moving, essentially his defensive line, completely abandoning the Jin Drinkers line. Yep. After merely a day of fighting. And what was funny was this defensive line was meant to hold out for four months. This was the first defensive line and they were believed that they could hold out there and then make subsequent lines of defense going back. It really was a World War I mentality for Britain to try and defend this area. And they did not believe at all that it would be broken in mere eight hours on the first attack. But here they were. Yep. Crisis situation. So because of this, Maltbury had no choice. And he uh, ordered all of his troops, except for the R Rashput divisions, to, hold, to completely abandon mainland and retreat to Hong Kong Island and they were going to make their defense. So during the retreat on December 13th, Maltbury did leave the Rashput warriors with their artillery to help defend the new Mayo uh, Tong line, sorry for the pronunciation, but it's essentially it was the southern, it was on the southern tip of mainland Hong Kong across from Lehman Straits. Now essentially what why this was important because this little little put peninsula more or less was a high ground and he believed he could put his artillery on there and have and he could supply them through the strait and make this almost like artillery position that could bomb the Japanese if they tried to invade mainland Hong Kong well by the end of the 13th that defensive line had been broken the the Rashput barely could put up a defense because everything was happening so fast that they also had to abandon the mainland and all the most of all the troops that he did need to evacuate did get off mainland onto the island including the, the Rajput. They were the last to actually get off. They were the last. And so now we go on to the second phase of this battle which is the assault on Hong Kong Island. island. Where things really start to heat up. The first attack on Hong Kong Island was on December 15th and it wasn't a major offensive. It was merely where the Rashford forces had left across the Lehman Strait, the Japanese who were there now thought that they could make a sneak attack on the defenders. And once again, just like before, they made a bunch of makeshift rafts and all that stuff and tried to cross the strait at night. Well, they were spotted immediately and with machine gun fire were turned back. But I might add that there is actually an interesting point of, uh, that's actually kind of a racist point to make here. Westerners at this point were told things, and this is coming straight from the mouths of Canadian soldiers, they were told things like the Japanese had nearsightedness, that they couldn't see very well, they couldn't see at night particularly, and that they were prone to seasickness. Now while this might sound like a joke, they actually, a lot of the officers took this very seriously. They didn't think the Japanese would attack them at night. And the Japanese, on the other hand, were told similar racist uh, stereotypes about Westerners, that they were effeminate, but more particularly that they were afraid to fight at night or in the rain. So, as we all know in the Pacific War, the Japanese did like to fight at night as a result of this. So now we come to the main invasion of Hong Kong Island after that failed uh, probing mission by the Japanese. So on the 17th, uh, the night of the 17th, of December the Japanese boarded all of their landing craft and under stealth crossed the Strait from mainland Hong Kong onto the island now the British defenders or the Commonwealth defenders I should say only spotted them halfway after they made the crossing and by this point it was too late to actually try and make a defense against them at sea because they were so close to the land. By the time they landed, they had they managed to set up. And the second the Japanese landed, it, excuse the language, all shit broke loose. Like, all hell, all broke, shit, loose. All yeah. hell broke loose. Like, it was the Japanese charged and were just fighting the British and the Commonwealth forces at every point. One of the most notable of this was a place called North Point, where it was the, the rash put warriors or regiment was placed there to defend. They fought the Japanese in hand-to-hand -hand heavy combat to almost the last man. 
Almost all the officers were killed, including most of all, but they fought and held back the Japanese as long as they could until eventually, just because the Japanese had the numbers, they were pushed back. I mean, this was still, it was a four to one scenario with 50,000 Japanese coming down upon 14,000 total troops of Canadians, most of which weren't in the north of the island fighting this. So, to the right of these rats that were being just, I can't say slaughtered because they were giving the hurt back to the Japanese as much as they were receiving it. They were just taking, they had such few troops that to lose one of them was sad to say, like losing 10 of the Japanese, like it just, eventually they lost the numbers. But to the right of them, there was a platoon of voluntary defense corps that were called the uh, Husseliers. Now these were, I, I'm not too sure the makeup of this regiment, but what was noticeable is, as the Rashputs, who was left of the Rashput, was being pushed back, they actually came in and occupied a um, an, an electrical plant. This was 80 people in this platoon with the, the retreating Rashputs. And when the Japanese came, they tried to assault them repeatedly, repeatedly. And this small platoon managed to hold them off for hours and hours. 80 men against thousands of Japanese were holding them off. They couldn't break them. And the only time they eventually surrendered was two hours later when they ran out of ammunition. But that's not even the end of their story because a portion of that platoon actually escaped. And during that escape, they managed to hold off the Japanese for a further 18 hours during their retreat, uh, their retreat to Victoria City. But sadly, at this point too, next to on now, what's the uh, right of North Point, the Japanese were also attacking there, and there was the the Canadians were situated here, and while they tried to hold out, they were eventually pushed back, and this was one of the first atrocities that happened on the high, the island of Hong Kong, because as the Canadians were pushed back, an artillery detachment was still there, and they were captured, and after being after surrendering, the Japanese killed every single artillery person there. The Canadians managed to counterattack this though and pushed them back slightly, but it was too late to do anything for the artillery, the artillery uh, detachment and the Canadians were eventually also pushed back just once again, a lack of numbers. This was the crutch of the British defense. They just didn't have the numbers to help repel such a large force. That They put in every tactics they can, slowing down measures, but at a certain point when you just have so many soldiers, you just get pushed back. You just can't defend yourself. And so by the end of which is now December 18th, essentially the Japanese had made a spearhead on the island at two points. And now we're pushing inwards towards now Maltbury's new defensive lines. Yeah, and the Japanese, they pushed to take Wong Yi Chong Gap where the British HQ was placed as its center point. Yeah, so this was the following day. This gap, I must say, is extremely important because this gap was the center point of the island. Essentially, all the main roads connected to it. And Maltbury had separated his forces into two battalions, the um, Eastern Peninsula Battalion and the Western um, Peninsula Battalion, each were in charge of defending half the island, essentially. Yeah. And so, of course, naturally, you would put um, your headquarters in this gap. And it was a fairly defensible place. They had, the, the British had been putting up their defenses for a while now. They had pillboxes everywhere. They had stationed Canadian, uh, the Cana one of the Canadian regiments along the heights there, too. It was a fairly defensible uh, place. But once again, the Japanese did what, the, what they were good at. They snuck up close to the lines and were able to just push the Canadian and the other defenders off that whole mountain ridge that surrounded the valley, push them back past something that's called um, Jasper's Point. And during this point, um, they had actually pushed into one of the, H, one of the um, uh, HQs and had managed to actually kill the commander brigadier John Kelburn Lawson, who was in charge 
of the Eastern Peninsula forces. So it's just this shows you how fast the Japanese were attacking that as they, they, they had defenders, this HQ, like there were whole, there were Canadian regiments there and Rajput regiments there defending and they got pushed back so fast, the HQ got overrun. But at the same time, the Canadians were once again able to counterattack, were able to push them past Jasper's Point again. But once again, with lack of numbers and ammunition, they got pushed right back to where they were. And this, once again, forced Maltori to change his defensive plans and adapt. But at the same time, he had to admit his island just got cut in half because on this one day, with the Japanese constantly pushing and pushing, was able to capture this gap, essentially cutting the British forces in two. Now, at the same time, on the, um, the Canadians on the eastern coast were also being attacked, and they were being pushed back closer and closer to Stanley's Peninsula, which Stanley's Peninsula is essentially on the southern part of the island. You'll see this kind of, it just juts out, and it's another major city on the island. So at this point, Maltbury, once again, now has to try and defend the island while counterattacking to try and re-link up with his um, cut-off forces. So now it's around December 21st. Essentially, Maltbury has now readjusted his lines. He's made a new defensive line around Victoria City going all the way down the island. The Canadians have started setting up their defensive lines near Stanley Peninsula. So it's not looking completely lost for the British at this point. They can still make a defensive position if they can just merely hold their lines, which has been extremely hard lately. So on December 21st, they, once again, Maltbury's main line was attacked and they got pushed back all the way back to Mount Cameron. And if you uh, don't have the image behind, uh, if you, the image oh, is Oh, I'll behind. have the images up. For those who are watching, there's going to be maps this whole time. But if, you, if you're not uh, watching, just give you a quick thing. Well, Maltbury made a defensive line past two mountain ranges. Um, Mount, uh, oh my god. Mount Cameroon. Ma Mount Cameroon was the second line of mountains. So it means in the one day, this line didn't just get pushed back one mountain range. They got pushed back two whole mountain ranges. And on top of that, by losing the first mountain range, they opened up their flank to Japanese artillery because they placed artillery now on this mountain range and started hammering uh, Maltbury's left defense of lines, which was the, once again, a Rashput, uh, a Punjab, um, defenders and they were just being hammered by artillery actually I was watching a documentary that was stating it was I believe at this hill where the Punjabs were defending because of the placement of the rocks they were standing upon the artillery actually fragmented and hit the rocks killing everybody that was around it so this was a devastating bombardment they barely could hold on like it was very quick and, yeah, and these defenders were near, um, near uh, what's it called? Leighton Hill. This is what it was called and it was just past Victoria City. So the tip of Victoria City. And when the Japanese pushed back by the 22nd, they were just in, in an undefensible position. They couldn't hold out and they were forced to retreat. Now at the same time, they managed to retreat while well, the English regiment that was next to them to help them also were holding them back, tried to retreat but were massacred by the artillery and, and push and the Japanese pushing forward. Now, on the same time, we are now going back to the Canadians who are near the Stanley Peninsula. Now, they tried to make a defensive line as they were constantly being pushed back, but the Canadians at every opportunity were counter-attack. And this is why Canada had a reputation at Hong Kong. It's because the Canadians, at every time they were pushed back, they would counter-attack. And when they counter attack they pushed the Japanese back. The Japanese did, were not expecting a Canadian counterattack, and every time the reason the Canadians got stopped was because they would run out of ammunition and a lack of manpower, and they were forced to retreat. And then when they retreated, they had to retreat even further back from where they, they attacked from, just because the lack of resources. But this is what the Canadians were just hammering and hammering the Japanese as they were getting pushed back, and this is where uh, why Canada was 
there was a certain reputation for Canadians at Hong Kong. And I, I forgot to mention, all of the British troops stationed here are all inexperienced soldiers. All Greens. Yeah. Everybody that was there was Greens, while the Japanese forces were battle-hardened from 1937 onwards. They've already been fighting the occupied Chinese territories. They had already, you know, fought in Shanghai and in Nanjing, and they've got their hands involved in atrocities already, mind you, a lot of these soldiers. So we're talking not just about a four to one odd situation, we're talking about battle-hardened veterans versus green troops. It, uh, this was honestly a setup for a massacre. Yeah. So at the same time now, the Japanese are attacking Maltbury on every front he's trying to set up. And we just saw Mount, he, he's gotten pushed back to Mount Cameron, which is kind of like, if you look at Hong Kong, he can't go back any further. Well, there's plenty of places behind it, none of them as defensible as this. This was his last defense for the Western Brigade. The Eastern Brigade, which was the Canadians, was constantly getting uh, pushed back closer and closer to the Stanley Peninsula, which was the essentially their last defensive p position. Now, to the south of Mount Cameron, there was also Rashput warriors defending the, the southern tip. Well, the Japanese, once again, attacked them and pushed them back. But when they pushed them back, they were um, a hill that was called Black Hill that was on the very southern tip of Hong Kong, then became uh, exposed. And soldiers from the Middlesex Regiment from England were stationed there and they, they surrendered seeing this because there was no way for them to escape. Well, this was another one of the atrocities. And uh, here, I'll just point in to give you a little break. When we say atrocities, or we use the words massacre, this really has to do with reports of people either surrendering or being in live action and being butchered down. Now, a lot of this is he said, she said kind of stuff, you know, in a lot of ways, but it has been reported that the Battle of Hong Kong, a lot of soldiers had surrendered after intensive fights. So you have to imagine if you're a Japanese soldier, someone just basically released their entire ammo clip, an entire platoon of these guys. And after butchering your fellow Japanese, they then put up the white flag. So not to, not to, you know, let them off the hook or anything, but the Japanese were absolutely killing uh, people instead of taking them as POWs. And even when they were taken as POWs, the Japanese killed a lot of them as well. Uh. Yeah, no, uh, very much so. It was a character characteristic of this battle. And just of the Pacific War in general. Yeah. <laughs> so, December 23rd. This is the key day of the battle. Because this was the day, spoilers, that the English essentially def couldn't lost their defensible position. On this day, Mount Cameron, that defensive line, was attacked by the Japanese. And they pushed straight through the middle of it, essentially cutting Maltbury's defensive line in two. And not just that, this completely opened up. The, his entire left flank, just like the day before where there was artillery, that, this happened again, but to even more devastating effect. Once again, the Punjab regiment that was to the left was took heavy fire but managed to escape, while the Middlesex regiment of British troops were stationed there too, couldn't get out, and they were also, once again, absolutely massacred. But at the same time, another point for the Canadians at the, a place called uh, Repulse Bay, a platoon of Canadian from, I, I believe it was the Calgary, uh, the Winnipeg Grenadiers. Winnipeg Grenadiers, yeah. Um, held up in the Repulse Hotel. And they, were, they held out there as the Japanese were trying to push through to try and hit the rear of the Canadians in the Stanley Peninsula. This one little hotel would hold out for three days under constant fire, lower on, low on ammunition, the Japanese just couldn't take it. This Canadian detachment just continuously fought them off and actually helped protect the, the um, Eastern Brigade's flank, the Canadian soldiers that were there. Just one small detachment. So that was another um, little Canadian point. But on this day, it cannot be overlooked. Maltbury's line and Mount Cameron was split in two. And when this happened, Victoria City was opened up. Essentially, they could not defend um, Lectin Hills anymore, which was just in front of Victoria Pass. Multiway had to retreat all of his forces back. 
and the Japanese were now cutting in from behind them. On the Canadians now were officially pushed back to the Stanley Peninsula. There, so they were essentially this was their last and, defense and yeah. this last defensible position. And all this happened on the 23rd. And by the 24th, Maltbury was he knew what was happening. He knew he couldn't defend. On the same Fort Canada, the Canadians on the 24th were making their last stand at the Stanley Peninsula. The British and the Rashput warriors to the south were constantly being pushed back. Victoria City had been overrun by this point. And most crucially, when they were overrun, the British lost their access to fresh water. They had no longer a, a, a water su supply. And mo this was essentially the writing on the wall. While the, the Canadians still at this point in the Stanley, Pen Stanley Peninsula, they were getting pushed past and closer and closer to the shore. Once again, the Canadians, they counterattacked relentlessly and would constantly they pushed the Japanese out of the Stanley Peninsula at one point on the 24th, but ran into the same problem. They were low on ammunition and they had to pull back. Now, during this time, this it's hard to get a real information on this, but at this point, one of the... The most yeah. well-known um, atrocity occurred at St. Stephen's College and it's also the most confusing and hard to report upon because there's a lot of misinformation on it. So basically, uh, I don't know if you want to start it off, what happened when the Japanese had taken the positions, they came into what is effectively was a hospital? Yes. So this was happening when I was talking about the Canadians being pushed back in the Stanley Plains and then doing counterattacking. This is happening during this time. So essentially, it's this, it's called the... Um, St. Stephen's College, which was the field hospital they were using, a frontline field hospital. And this had been, the Canadians were pushed past this at one point, and that's when the Japanese first wave of Japanese came across this uh, college. And I'll let uh, my colleague over here talk about it. So what is being reported is in the scuffle that actually went on, I guess you would say about two days, because it, the Japanese came in, and then there was a counterattack by the Canadians, which kicked them out, but atrocities had occurred in the meantime, and then they took it back over again. What ends up happening is, for lack of better words, a lot of men were injured in the uh, beds in the hospital, and they were bayoneted to death. Now, the hospital also had a cremation uh, location, so a lot of the bodies were immediately cremated after the events of the Battle of Hong Kong, so that's why it's hard to report on this, but there's eyewitness accounts of uh, the nurses were pulled away, uh, raped. Uh, there was one, I believe he was a Canadian soldier. He tried to stop the raping of nurses. His name was Captain Overton Stark Hickey, and he was murdered uh, trying to stop some of the rapes. The uh, Japanese, there was no mercy. There was absolutely no mercy for the men that were there, or the women. No, yeah, there was, like like he was saying before, they, it happened in two waves. Yeah. Like the first wave came in and the two doctors that were stationed there came out to greet the Japanese in hopes of saving the lives of the people there. And those, those two doctors were taken away immediately and it was found out later that both of them had been mutilated and murdered. And then the Canadians came back in, like Craig said, pushed them out. And then a second wave came in and this is when they went through the hospital bayoneting, mutilating and raping all the people in there. And it's not just this place, it was done in other places <laughs> in Hong Kong too, and they told uh, later on when there was a surrender, they told the Canadians that they were taking care of the injured and sick and that to just move on when they were being marched off, and of course they were yeah. simply killing uh, everyone who was in the hospital beds. So by the end of December 24th, this is how the situation stands. In the Eastern Brigade, the Canadians have essentially almost out of ammo, have been pushed back to the tip of Stanley Peninsula, and they were, it, reports were saying the Canadians were planning a last stand. Like, Oh, well, we, I don't know if we got into it, and I'm actually not sure which one of these counterattacks it occurs, but I believe it's at the end. Uh, there was a Canadian group that was told to make basically a bonsai charge. Mm -hmm. They uh, were told to just attack a Japanese position with bayonets, and even the guys who were doing it said that it was absolutely crazy. They ended up doing it, they successfully counterattacked, but then again, the Japanese just came hours later and yeah. they just took it over. It was... That was the regular occurrence at this battle. 
we have to say it's it wasn't like the defenders didn't have heart and i'm not just talking canadians the rash the, put Indi the Pujar, yeah the indian they, forces are the ones who got it the worst probably yeah. it's uh i mean notoriously pacific war world war one world war two the Colonial forces, you know, usually we, as Canadians or as Anzac, we got thrown in the worst places on earth, but it's nothing compared to the Indian troops. Yeah. Indian troops got the worst end of the stick when it came to And us. I cannot attest more to the bravery and valentry of these troops. Yeah. Like, they stood their ground. Sometimes... They, they fought guerrilla warfare from the first day of this battle. Yeah. They were all the way at the top section when this, uh, the Royal Scots yeah. were taken out. We kept fighting day by day, night by night, just guerrilla warfare, trying mm -hmm. to slow down the Japanese advances. They fought like, like maniacs. Sometimes they fought to the last man. Yeah. I cannot stress enough, like, the defenders of this island, they did their hardest and put their everything they possibly could into it. But unfortunately, they were never told that this was just an outpost and it just uh civilians were told by the british that uh, the japanese would never attack and that there was enough forces yeah. that uh the gin drinkers line was basically it was a remake of the mountain line exactly. in france yeah. that was the same idea that they couldn't cross it which is kind of funny when you think about world yeah. war ii as two of the lines fell right and especially like england had been fighting now for close to two years against the germans and the germans had proven like defensive lines are but uh, we're going to get into this, yeah. but I'll let you finish before I talk about how yeah. race plays into this. So, of course. So, it's December 25th now. Uh, Maltbury's Western Brigade has been split in two. Uh, Victoria City is essentially lost. They, they can't get it back, even though they were counterattacking. Once again, Maltbury counterattacked at every opportunity possible. On the southern front, the rash puts had been just continuously pushed back and were almost being pushed off the island. On the east, the Canadians, like we were saying before, were brandishing for their final last stand because they truly believed that from just seeing the atrocities that they got to experience, that they were all going to die. So they were saying, we're going out fighting. And Maltbury, by this point, what realized... Yeah, the towel was coming. It, he knew there was nothing, especially the water was the killing blow. Without the water, yes, he knew it's true that he could yeah. like he was planning on if he could hold Victoria City, he was still planning a protracted defense for as long as possible. But the Japanese had all the utilities under their control. Like you said, the water <laughs> supply, you can't fight under these conditions. Mm -hmm. I mean so, unless you're the Japanese on a poor island in the Pacific. Yeah. I mean they ended up fighting under those conditions, <laughs> but that's another thing. Yeah, so Multiple eventually accepted it and by midday on December 25th, he told the Japanese that he asked for a ceasefire and surrender. And, and this is the event known as Black Christmas to those in Hong Kong. Yes. And to this day, it's still a significant uh, historic event that they talk yeah. about. Because following these, as my colleague will say, it was followed by three days of uncontrolled rape, pillage, and... Just killing of su surrendered soldiers uh, but the japan like you can argue oh they were fighting or they had just surrendered and what does that mean in the heat of the moment yeah but there is absolute evidence that after the surrender there was atrocities and we know from the pow's experience mm -hmm. there was atrocities and uh well that was effectively the battle of hong kong and uh i actually wanted to talk about just a few more things that i think are pertinent to this and one of them happens to do with the role of race and racism in the Pacific War in general, but I wanted to get, you know, specifically for Hong Kong. Now, we can't speak about the Battle of Hong Kong without kind of explaining the situation globally. Uh, Pearl Harbor simultaneously occurred with this, and, you know, Singapore is going to get attacked, the Dutch East Indies, the, the Japanese spread out, and they were taking all these territories at the same time. Now, before Pearl Harbor, this was kind of what was being perpetuated in the Western world, particularly in America. Things like this. They would say things like, the Japanese are little brown men, and we are quite larger white men. The Germans are, you know, they're well known for tremendous fighting, and they are builders. Whereas the Japanese, they're nothing but pushovers. Here's another point to be made. They don't see well. We'll talk about the Japanese, especially at night. We knew this as a matter of fact. They couldn't build good weapons, they just made junky equipment. They just imitated us. All we had to do was get out there and sink them. These are quotes from uh, Americans or possibly British personnel. Here's another one. Uh, the Japanese have physiological defects like nearsightedness, 
balance problems, and numerous brain functioning issues. I actually read an <laughs> article, I, we were in the same class, our teacher told us this. A rationale for why they believe these things about the Japanese, or Asians in general, is they thought that Japanese uh, rice harvesters would have their babies on their back in a sack because, you know, they had children with them, and of course they did. And they thought that the shaking of the babies in their sack while they were rice harvest har harvesting would shake the brain around and the development of the brain would end up, you know, screwing around with them and they'd have, like I said, nearsightedness and all these other stupidities. This is absolutely untrue. But this actually persisted, and if you think this is a joke, military personnel actually believed this, and they made plans based off this. Now, after Pearl Harbor, uh, attitudes changed quite a bit. So, here's one from La Roque, who was uh, uh, personnel at Pearl Harbor, and he said after, It turns out they could see better than we could, and their torpedoes, unlike ours, worked. <laughs> I like that quote, and that's why yeah. I kept it there. <laughs> After Pearl Harbor, um, a lot of the, and especially after the Hong Kong invasion, the Philippines invasion, and Singapore, I mean, this is devastating the first years of the war, the racist attitudes changed from the inferiority of the Japanese to the yellow peril trope, which, you know, was the Japanese were going to get a Pan-Asia together, and they were going to do barbaric acts, they were going to be savage, and they were going to just take over. And even, even before World War II, the yellow peril existed, it's just they kind of had to switch the narrative, because... Saying how inferior a race of people who are defeating you almost every single battle doesn't work so well. Uh, here's uh, from Life Magazine, which published an article on how to tell a Japanese from a Chinese person based off the shape of their nose and the stature of their body. Uh, a anthropologist, Dr. Elis Hindlika, stated in 1941, you cannot tell the Oriental peoples in their country apart reliably and consistently by scrutinizing their faces because when you pick out a Japanese or a Chinese readily, you might be right about 30% 30, 30 of the times. Japanese, however, are clever, smarter, with a smarter expression. The reflection of their materialistic and commercial interests are there. Chinese have faces that are mild and friendly and interesting. <laughs> this reflects their philosophical and intellectual background. Because apparently our ideological traits make our faces change uh, in this very prestigious anthropologist's mind. Of course, a lot of people thought these stupid things back then, but still, we need to poke fun at how stupid and dumb this is, because this yeah. racism played into the war. Now, particular to Hong Kong, what was told to our Canadian soldiers, which is reminiscent of all this, is... Don't worry, Japanese, they can't see at night. They all wear glasses, was a common phrase told to all Canadian soldiers. Um, here is another one that I picked up from a documentary, which I thought was pretty heinous. It's uh, in reference to some Canadian soldiers living in Hong Kong just before this hit. If you hit a Chinaman with your car, look back in your rear side mirror. If he's still moving, run him over. Because it's too expensive to pay for that hospital bill, which they will bill you, and it's a lot cheaper to pay for the funeral. So that just kind of gives you a sense of yeah. the time period and what we're, we're seeing here. I mean, there are races against any groups, of course. Uh, mm -hmm. But it actually affected combat. And uh, if you think it's just one-sided, the Japanese on the other side of the coin were actually taught that Western men were effeminate and that they were afraid to fight in, uh, at nighttime or in the rain. And you could honestly believe so because the Japanese made a real name for themselves doing night attacks, especially oh, yeah. naval night attacks, which were terrifying because no yep. one wanted to fight at night before you know radar was really kicking off and stuff. I think that would be a, a good video for the future to talk about some of those. Letty Golf, I think. Yeah. Is, uh, yeah, just, anyway, yeah. just open it up with spotlights and then just whole battle, just like playing a, a, a World of Worship games. You just open just up. Night, and it's just like flares yeah. go off and you're just yeah. you're shooting like a, what, a two kilometers away from you into the <laughs> darkness. And uh, I thought this was great uh, because apparently while we're filming this, this is a huge issue is the uh, Dr. Seuss gets involved in this a little bit. As we know, he did anti-Japanese cartoons at the time. If you know the Fifth Column uh, cartoon, which I'll obviously edit in, but I mean, it's a very famous picture. Uh, that's one of his work. And it's basically the idea that all the Japanese in America or Canada are secret agents out mm -hmm. to win the war for the Japanese. So don't talk to them. And the internment camps are a good thing. You know, this is what's being perpetuated by them. Uh, there was also a picture he did where, uh, and it's a weird one, it's uh, Jap Alley Cats. And it's a bunch of Japanese being depicted as cats jumping over an alleyway fence and Uncle Sam kind of 
holding one up while the millions of them are jumping mm -hmm. over. The yellow peril is at play there. And uh, to really categorize it, the, the real problem with Dr. Seuss's characters during this, of course it was racist, but uh, if you look at how he treats the Axis, if he's talking about the Germans, it's Hitler. If he's talking about the Italians, it's, you know, he's making fun of Mussolini. If he's talking about the Japanese, it was really overkill characters of the Japanese people. It wasn't really Tojo that he was showing so much. And I'll put up and edit a bunch of these photos to show you, but you get a real sense, and it's not just Dr. Seuss. Uh, this was wartime propaganda. This, you know, they were trying to make the enemy subhuman so that the American soldiers would fight on and such, but it gives you a taste of the flavor of the day. And uh, I have an interesting point of note, because I was looking it up myself. Uh, Dr. Seuss, after the war, in 1953, he visited Japan, and he made friends with a local Japanese man, and he felt so awful about the work he had done during World War II, that when he published his book, Horton Hears a Who, in 1954, um, he actually had the little disclaimer in the book stating, and it's awkward to say this, a person is a person no matter how small. Which, in his way, was towards his great friend Mitsugi Nakamura of Kyoto. So, poor choice of words, Dr. Yeah. Seuss. Uh, in red, uh, but, uh, yeah, it, all to say, racism how to play at this and why am I bringing up the issue of race and racism because of the atrocities that were committed uh, there's a certain flavor that racism kind of feeds into and um, what it really comes down to is the Japanese knew what the Westerners thought of them we see this you know uh, after the treatment the Japanese received in World War one when they be they were told they were a superpower but they weren't racially equal they never forgot this this is a grudge they knew that they were being regarded as inferior to white Western races. So, being a nation uh, that was trying to occupy other nations, which happened to be different Asian groups, they decided that they would make themselves a superior Asian group over other Asian nations, such as China or Korea, for instance. So they were trying to portray themselves as being, in their minds, you know, the, the white racial hierarchy mm -hmm. over these Asian groups. So it was kind of a awkward to say like a coping mechanism that they were being you know denigrated by these westerners but at least they could denigrate these people over in their backyard so to say mm -hmm. that led to a lot of messed up things so in 1929 the geneva convention uh highlighted that pow's would be offered protections you know anyone that was captured in our conflict you know they'd be given adequate food shelter material goods medical treatment all such japan did not ratify the geneva convention so that's very important to know as to why some of these atrocities occurred. And I am not trying to make light of what Japan did. Japan did horrible acts, but I'm just trying to give some kind of rational background for why it got as bad as it did, because it was arguably the worst in World War II. Yeah, even some, a lot of times worse than the Germans, mind you. It's really bad. So, um, to give an idea, let me go here. I have some statistics. 4% of Allied POWs in German hands perished. Compared to the Japanese, it was 27%. That, that's incredible. The total number of civilians and prisoners murdered by the Japanese between 1937 to 1945 was an estimated 20 million civilians. So the Japanese had a particular flavor for these atrocities. The Japanese reported during the Battle of Hong Kong that 675 men were killed with a 20, 1,079 wounded, but Western estimates put it up to about maybe like 2,000 dead and 6,000 casualties. Allied casualties were around 11,111, with another 11,000 missing and another 11.3 thousand wounded. The Sea Force, so our Canadian forces, 23 officers and 267 soldiers were killed. Some of them were murdered after they had surrendered. On February 1942, the Japanese government stated the number of prisoners of war it received from Hong Kong, and it was about 5,000 for the British, 1.6 thousand Canadians, Indians, 3.8 thousand, and others of other nationalities, about 357. Of the Canadians captured alone during the battle, 267 to perish, like I said, mainly uh, due to neglect and abuse afterwards as POWs. Now, to kind of talk about the atrocities. I tried to really come with a summarization of all this, but there's about four major reasons why the Japanese performed such heinous acts. 
The first one, like I said, racism and an inferiority complex. The second is a distorted Bushido code and militarism. The third is how their military operated. And the fourth, um, it's not really a reason, but why they beheaded so many people is actually something that more has more so has to do with their culture. You have to remember these people come from you know the samurais and beheading in the Japanese culture at this time was not seen like as barbaric and savage as we would have witnessed. You know, like our our, our prisoners of war at that time were like, this is bar I can't believe what they're doing. This is disgusting. They cut off my friend's head on this and that. And of course, this is awful, awful stuff. But for a lot of the Japanese, this is kind of it was honorable to do this as disgusting as it is to say and they did disgusting things like if you've ever heard of the um there was a competition between two men on how many heads they could cut of pow's oh, this, oh, yeah this this happened this is a really bad one not to get into it too much but yeah i already explained the race and inferiority complex really came about from world war one and the treatment of the japanese like the japanese were hearing how they were being treated in america uh you know they knew about the internment camps after they knew that they were treated as lesser people so they went out of their way to stamp on uh, the Chinese particularly and treat them like quote unquote dogs, as lesser people, subhumans. They tried to make it seem like Westerners were effeminate or, you know, th there wasn't much they could say about Westerners, but they certainly treated other Asian groups horrifyingly. I mean, uh, even Okinawans got it pretty bad. <laughs> Believe that. Um, Japan saw its war in China as pretty much a holy war because of all this and there was an ultra nationalistic spice to it whereas you know it really it invigorated and empowered the idea that the Japanese were quote unquote the Yamato race and that they were destined to rule over all of Asia and all these atrocious things that they're doing to these people it was all in their best interest later on because they were nothing but children before them and they would be taken over by them uh, actually the Greater East Asia Co prosperity sphere probably would have done well if the Japanese weren't so horrible to every Asian group they came into <laughs> contact with. It actually, uh, you know, the Yellow Peril had some uh, some right to it because uh, Japan could have very well got Asia to come all together if they could have settled their differences with China, but... It's, it's almost like um, when the Germans invaded Ukraine, the Ukrainians <laughs> yeah. overall were not fond of the Russians and actually a lot of them Wanted stated, to join the Nazis. Yeah. <laughs> But the Nazis came in and the Nazis viewed the Ukrainians as the same as the Russians. And because of that, they lost out on an ally that would have fought to the death with them. Because remember, not to get off on a tangent, but in Ukraine, they were all starved out by the Russians. So, yeah. And just like in, in Asia, there was a lot of places, a lot of countries that were very unhappy with the Western people. Just going through colonization, the British treatment, as we were talking about the racism and all that before, like... Chinese, there was the Chinese head tax, there was yeah. the gentleman's agreement where Japanese were told they couldn't enter Canada or the United States anymore, they were being barred from immigration yeah. because they didn't want them anymore, and when they did want them, they brought them over to work on the railroads, didn't let them bring their families over because they didn't want them to have their families there. And then kick them out once they were done building it, go back. So yep. just think, you had these Japanese, if they came along being like, yo, we're actually liberators, we want to kick them, we want to kick the Westerners out and make a Pan-Asia you want to join us there's probably a few that would have said yeah but instead they wanted they came in with the mess the western mentality of we need to dominate and be at the top mm -hmm. and then they made a lot of enemies like that way and to get back to it past the racism um we were talking i was mentioning the militarism and uh, a distorted bushido code so as you might imagine bushido code the warrior does not surrender they die to the last man they actually had a nickname for the Geneva Convention, and that was uh, the Coward's Code in Japan. Basically, anybody that surrendered to them, it was seen as immediate as cowardice. So when, and you have to really, I know this is horrifying to say, but if you're a Japanese soldier and you've just fought a battle and the forces basically just ran out of ammunition, just gunning you down, and then they surrendered after killing most of your friends, mm -hmm. you're going to be angry. And there's another, I'll get to it, there's another flavor to this, but it had a lot to do with why they performed their atrocities. And I know people are going to comment, section, I am not saying, I am not trying to belittle what the Japanese did. The Japanese were it was horrifying what they did, and they should have all seen justice. And a lot of them did. A lot of them 
a lot of them got away with it, mind you, but a lot of high-ranking and officers got executed. Just to give you some comparison, when the Canadians invaded Europe in 1944, there were a lot of cases of the yeah. Germans fighting until the last bullet and then surrendering too. And when they came out, the Canadians knew this and would gun them all down because... Yeah, yeah that's true. So, yeah. it, there are two sides. Like, there are atrocities on both sides. And the Japanese, we also have to take into account... The Japanese military were literally told and brainwashed that the Westerners don't take prisoners. You are going to be mistreated. You will be butchered and killed and all that well, stuff. Th this, here, I'll explain it like this because a lot of people kind of get this, oh, they were robots, you know, oh, they were brainwashed. What, what actually really happens is you have not ratified the Geneva Convention. You, as a country, are saying you will not maybe take prisoners. Mm -hmm. So you're already saying that you might do the bad thing. The Japanese were, the, the soldiers were pushed to do atrocities and now expected it to be done back to them. So they were terrified mm -hmm. that, oh yeah, this horrible stuff that we're being forced to do is going to be done to us. So it just kept pushing and pushing the envelope. That's why they kept doing it. And there's also, the way that the military worked in Japan has a large reason to do with this. So basically, the only way to really describe it is it's a network of bullies. So your high-ranking officers were basically told, you know, they, they would bully the lower ranking officers whenever they were frustrated physically like beat the hell out of them like horrifyingly and then the subordinate officer would go and beat someone lower than him and then lower than him so when the Japanese when the regular grunt soldier was getting beaten for whatever was going on they usually would go and take it out in civilians and if you think this isn't a large issue this was so epidemic in their military that this became the norm. They were so used to being beaten. And the high-ranking officers were, were like, for instance, the, the, the Lieutenant General in the Battle of Hong Kong, he was frustrated because he had a deadline to meet when he was uh, doing this. Mm -hmm. He didn't meet his deadline and he had to ask for an extension and he was reprimanded for it. Like they like, gave him a lot of shit. And then he probably beat one of his subordinates and the subordinates beat more. And this actually does happen. And it's a culture that is persistent throughout the whole Pacific War. It's, it's really, it's a, it's a gross situation and it really fed into the war machine of doing these atrocities. Uh, here, I had some things to say about Tojo personally giving orders. So Tojo was personally responsible for running POW camps and his orders to camp commanders read this. You must not allow prisoners to lie idle, doing nothing but eating freely for even a single day. Their labor and technical skill should be fully utilized for the replenishment of production and contribution rendered toward the pre prosecution of the Greater East Asiatic War, for which no effort ought to be spared. Tojo also said, in Japan, we have our own ideology concerning POWs, which should naturally make their treatment more or less different from that in Europe and America. He ordered his, command, his camp commanders to harden their hearts and not be obsessed with the mistaken idea of humanitarianism or swayed by personal feelings. Everybody from the top rank is telling their military that because we are not ratifying these treat treaties, before, because we are acting this, basically we're acting like we won't get any levity, we're not going to give any back. It's almost as if they were preemptively expecting that they were going to be ethnically cleansed in mm -hmm. a way and they just did it first it's really bizarre but it's true this is a large reason why the atrocities happened because i mean war is hell but uh, the pacific war is a different type of flavor altogether now i had an interesting quote uh getting back to the whole beheading thing i thought this was a it doesn't really do anything but it, it's a weird one let's just say the least this is a man who actually beheaded somebody uh probably pow mind you he said it is amazing he had killed him in one stroke. The onlookers crowd forward. The head detached from the trunk rolls in front of it. The dark blood gushes out. All is over. The head is dead white like a doll. The savageness which I felt only a little while ago is gone, and now I feel nothing but the true compassion of Japanese Bushido. Senior, corp senior Corporal laughs loudly. Well, he will enter Nirvana now. So, they really... In the essence, I, I don't even want to say that they thought maybe they were doing the soldiers some good by beheading them, but eh, these, uh, these awful atrocities yeah. occurred for one way or another. Uh, just to finish off this rather long podcast, I wanted to talk a little bit about after the Battle of Hong Kong, because Hong Kong was occupied by the Japanese. So during the occupation of Hong Kong, there was a martial law, as you'd imagine, and Rensuke Yusogei established an administrative center 
at a military HQ at the Peninsula Hotel in Kulun. And he had a puppet Chinese representative council and a Chinese cooperative council mm. consisting of local Chinese leaders, uh, which helped, you know, his control over it. So, uh, Governor Mark Young handed over 7,000 British soldiers and civilians, which were kept in POW internment camps, such as at Cham Shu Po prisoner camp and Stanley internment camp in early 1942. Former Hong Kong police were recruited to reform a Kenpei Thai force, that's the special police of Japan, and they were made up mostly of Chinese and some Indians, interestingly enough, who periodically performed executions on the local populace oh. to keep them in, in yeah. Yeah, so there was some people kind of joining the uh, Japanese. Well, I feel like in any type of occupation, you always have that like 10% that are uh, co collaborators into it. Hey, they probably fed them and there was no that, food. They, 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 were, they probably, the, the other side was, or I can be the person on the other side getting beheaded. Yeah. Or we don't know why. They could have families, they could have, maybe they were exploited in this situation, but in a lot of times there's just no winners in any of these situations. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think I said at the beginning of the episode, the Hong Kong dollar was outlawed and replaced by military yen, which was distributed by the military. <laughs> Hyperinflation impoverished the people of Hong Kong, and the Japanese exchanged all Hong Kong dollars and sold the dollars to finance the wartime economy. Public transport completely failed, utilities failed, and there was a shortage of fuel, because I mean, the Japanese had no fuel, and uh, there was periodic aerial bombings. Tens of thousands became homeless. The Japanese established an education system with the primary goal is to facilitate the Japanese control over the local population, and uh, they basically were trying to teach um, the Chinese Japanese. It didn't go very well, and a Cantonese language school actually came about, and the, the teacher went on to say that teaching Japanese to the Chinese would be easier than teaching Cantonese to the Japanese as uh, it was an issue of the characters. There was no references back then. It was really hard for them to, uh, to teach that way. Um, it failed. All of it did. Uh, the Japanese actually made a bilingual system of speaking English mostly to the local residents, so they ironically spoke more English. Well. <laughs> yeah. The Japanese introduced a policy of forced deportation, like I said, where 1.6 million went down to about 600,000 by 1945 to the local population, and that was just getting rid of the people they didn't want to the mainland of China, which was another area ridden by a lot of other problems. Uh, the Japanese rationed literally everything, rice, oil, flour, salt, and sugar. Each family was given a rationing license, and every person could buy about 6.4 tails of rice per day. The majority of people did not have enough food to survive, and a lot of people died of starvation. Rape, murder, and torture were the norm in Hong Kong during this period, and it's an estimated about 10,000 Hong Kong civilians were executed alone. There were resistance movements. Originally formed in Zhangxing in Guangdong in 1939, the East River Column was comprised of peasants, students, and seamen. The guerrilla force grew from 200 to 6,000 men by 1941, and in 1942, the East River guerrillas joined forces with the Dangjiang and Zhijiang Pearl River forces. These are two large resistance groups in the area. The guerrillas were able to rescue American pilots who parachuted into Kowloon when their planes were downed by the Japanese. And when the British retreated, the guerrillas took their abandoned weapons to basically arm themselves, and they were mostly found in the new territories in Kulun, where they would just, you know, do guerrilla warfare. They employed, you know, they applied um, all the tactics you can imagine as guerrilla warfare even today. They protected traders in Kulun in Gangzhou, and then attacked the local police stations at Taupo. They bombed the Taiki the Kai Tak airport, which poor airport, man, I can imagine yeah. it's been bombed how many years. And uh, they ended up helping, actually, the Allied POWs. I had one part here. Uh, where was it? They were around 400 people. They rescued POWs, notably Sir Lindsay, Sir Douglas Clegg, Professor Gordon King, and David Bosanak. In December 1943, the forces joined the East River guerrillas. Uh, sorry, this uh, was another group, the HK Kowloon Brigade, which joined these... Um, other resistance groups so they were basically they were there trying to rescue some POWs and cause some mayhem and they made uh, significant efforts during the years of occupation but you know needless to say you know the Chinese didn't just sit down in mm -hmm. Hong Kong they were actively fighting and uh, if anyone was wondering uh, I think I said at the beginning but General Takashi Sakai who led the invasion of Hong Kong was found guilty of unbelievable amount of atrocities that he uh, did and he was executed.
for this. And yeah, this has been probably a rather long podcast. Yeah, that was, went on a lot longer than expected, but yeah. you can see how just this small little battle has such huge implications over so many um, theaters and all that. Like, Hong Kong was a major yet insignificant battle. It, yep. it had both, like militarily. Forty well, percent of all the trade went into Hong Kong. Exactly. So for the Japanese, it was they had to take and it. And militarily, yeah, it's one of the. It could be considered a skirmish almost by the amount of soldiers being employed compared to other battles. But it had such implications afterwards, especially for the Chinese losing forty percent in your trade. That's a that's a pretty big chunk gone. Yeah, and it would lead to the Burma campaign, to the Indian roads mm -hmm. being opened up, to. I remember that they were trying to fly some of the transports, but by the time, yeah, anyways, yeah. it's a bloody yeah. nightmare. Yeah, no, this was a, you could definitely say as one of the major starting points for the British in Southeast Asia and their contribution to this war in that area. And for Canada, it's the biggest one that we had to deal with in the Pacific. Of course, Canadians volunteered, they were yeah. fighting and all numerous battles during the Pacific War, as Australian troops, of course, and, uh, and other groups were too. Yeah. All right. But yeah. Uh, this has uh, been the Pacific War Channel, and I'm going to have to edit a lot of this. <laughs> oh boy. It's yeah. going to be fun. Uh, thanks for listening, and hopefully you enjoyed this. Over and out. Bye.